Part 5 of The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5 In this case, Captain Isaac Hull was matched against five British captains, two of whom, Broke and Byron, were fully equal to any in their navy, and while the latter showed great perseverance, good seamanship, and ready imitation, there can be no doubt that the palm in every way belongs to the cool old Yankee, every daring expedient known to the most perfect seamanship was tried and tried with success and no victorious fight could reflect more credit on the conqueror than this three days chase did on hull later on two occasions the constitution proved herself far superior in gunnery to the average british frigate this time her officers and men showed that they could handle the sails as well as they could the guns hull out manoeuvred broke and byron as cleverly as a month later he outfought dacre his successful escape and a victorious fight were both performed in a way that place him above any single ship captain of war End of footnote on august second the constitution made sail from boston footnote letter of captain isaac hull august twenty eighth eighteen twelve and stood to the eastward in hopes of falling in with some of the british cruisers she was unsuccessful however and met nothing then she ran down to the bay of fundy steered along the coast of nova scotia and thence toward newfoundland and finally took her station off cape race in the gulf of st lawrence where she took and burned two brigs of little value on the fifteenth she recaptured an american brig from the british ship sloop avenger though the latter escaped captain hull manned his prize and sent her in he then sailed southward and on the night of the eighteenth spoke a salem privateer which gave him news of a british frigate to the south thither he stood and at two p m on the nineteenth in latitude forty one degrees thirty minutes north and fifty five degrees west made out a large sail bearing east south east and to leeward footnote letter of captain isaac hull august thirtieth eighteen twelve and of footnote which proved to be his old acquaintance the frigate guerriere captain dacre it was a cloudy day and the wind was blowing fresh from the northwest the guerriere was standing by the wind on the starboard tack under easy canvas footnote letter of captain james r dacre september seventh eighteen twelve and a footnote she hauled up her courses took in her top gallant sails and at four thirty backed her main topsail hull then very deliberately began to shorten sail taking in top gallant sails stay sails and a flying jib sending down the royal yards and putting another reef in the topsails soon the englishman hoisted three ensigns when the american also set her colors one at each masthead and one at the mizzen peak the constitution ran down with the wind nearly aft the guerriere was on the starboard tack and at five o'clock opened with her weather guns footnote log of guerriere end of footnote the shot falling short then wore round and fired her port broadside of which two shot struck her opponent the rest passing over and through her rigging footnote see in the naval archives bureau of navigation the constitution's log book volume two from february first eighteen twelve to december thirteenth eighteen thirteen the point is of some little importance because hall in his letter speaks as if both the first broadsides fell short whereas the log distinctly says that the second went over the ship except two shot 
which came home. The hypothesis of the guerriere having damaged powder was founded purely on this supposed falling short of the first two broadsides. End of footnote. As the British frigate again wore to open with her starboard battery, the Constitution yawed a little and fired two or three of her port bow guns. Three or four times the guerriere repeated this manoeuvre, wearing and firing alternate broadsides, but with little or no effect, while the Constitution yawed as often to avoid being raked and occasionally fired one of her bow guns. This continued nearly an hour, as the vessels were very far apart when the action began, hardly any loss or damage being inflicted by either party. At six o'clock the guerriere bore up and ran off under her topsails and jib with the wind almost astern, a little on her port quarter. When the Constitution set her main top gallant sails and foresail, and at six o five closed within half pistol shot distance on her adversary's port beam. Footnote Autobiography of Commodore Morris Annapolis eighteen eighteen page one sixty four and a footnote. Immediately a furious cannonade opened each ship firing as the guns bore. By the time the ships were fairly abreast, at 6.20, the Constitution shot away the Guerrier's mizzenmast, which fell over the starboard quarter, knocking a large hole in the counter and bringing the ship round against her helm. Hitherto she had suffered very greatly, and the Constitution hardly at all. The latter, finding that she was ranging ahead, put her helm aport and then luffed short round her enemy's bows footnote log of constitution and a footnote delivering a heavy raking fire with the starboard guns and shooting away the guerriere's main yard then she wore and again passed her adversary's bows raking with her port guns the mizzenmast of the guerriere dragging in the water had by this time pulled her bow round till the wind came on her starboard quarter and so near were the ships that the englishman's bowsprit passed diagonally over the constitution's quarter-deck and as the latter ship fell off it got foul of her mizzen rigging and the vessels then lay with the guerriere's starboard bow against the constitution's port or lee quarter gallery footnote cooper in putnam's magazine volume one page four seventy five and of footnote the englishman's bow guns played havoc with captain hull's cabin setting fire to it but the flames were soon extinguished by lieutenant huffman on both sides the boarders were called away the british ran forward but captain dacre relinquished the idea of attacking footnote address of captain dacre to the court-martial at halifax End of footnote. when he saw the crowds of men on the americans deck meanwhile on the constitution the boarders and marines gathered aft but such a heavy sea was running that they could not get on the guerriere both sides suffered heavily from the closeness of the musketry fire indeed almost the entire loss on the constitution occurred at this juncture as lieutenant bush of the marines sprang upon the taffrail to leap on the enemy's deck a british marine shot him dead mr morris the first lieutenant and mr alwyn the master had also both leaped on the taffrail and both were at the same moment wounded by the musketry fire on the guerriere the loss was far heavier almost all the men on the forecastle being picked off captain dacre himself was shot at the back and severely wounded by one of the american mizzen topmen while he was standing on the starboard forecastle hammocks cheering on his crew footnote james volume six page one forty four and a footnote 
two of the lieutenants and the master were also shot down the ships gradually worked round till the wind was again on the port quarter when they separated and the guerriers foremast and mainmast at once went by the board and fell over on the starboard side leaving her a defenceless hulk rolling her main deck guns into the water footnote brenton volume five page fifty one end of footnote at six thirty the constitution hauled aboard her tacks ran off a little distance to the eastward and lay to her braces and standing and running rigging were much cut up and some of the spars wounded but a few minutes sufficed to repair damages when captain hull stood under his adversary's lee and the latter at once struck at seven p m footnote log of the constitution end of footnote just two hours after she had fired the first shot on the part of the constitution however the actual fighting exclusive of six or eight guns fired during the first hour while closing occupied less than thirty minutes comparative force the constitution one thousand five hundred seventy six tons twenty seven guns six hundred eighty four pound broadside four hundred fifty six men fourteen loss comparative force one point zero zero comparative loss inflicted one point zero zero the guerriere thirteen hundred thirty eight tons twenty five guns five hundred fifty six weight broadside two hundred seventy two men seventy nine loss comparative force point seven zero comparative loss inflicted point eighteen the loss of the constitution included lieutenant william s bush of the marines and six seamen killed and her first lieutenant charles morris master john c alwyn four seamen and one marine wounded total seven killed and seven wounded almost all this loss occurred when the ships came afoul and was due to the guerriere's musketry and the two guns in her bridle ports the guerriere lost twenty-three killed and mortally wounded including her second lieutenant henry reddy and fifty-six wounded severely and slightly including captain dacre himself the first lieutenant bartholomew kent master robert scott two masters mates and one midshipman the third lieutenant of the constitution mr george campbell reed was sent on board the prize and the constitution remained by her during the night but at daylight it was found that she was in danger of sinking captain hull at once began removing the prisoners and at three o'clock in the afternoon set the guerriere on fire and in a quarter of an hour she blew up he then set sail for boston where he arrived on august thirtieth captain hull and his officers writes captain dacre in his official letter have treated us like brave and generous enemies the greatest care has been taken that we should not lose the smallest trifle the british laid a very great stress on the rotten and decayed condition of the guerriere mentioning in particular that the mainmast fell solely because of the weight of the falling foremast but it must be remembered that until the action occurred she was considered a very fine ship thus in brighton's memoir of admiral broke it is declared that dacre freely expressed the opinion that she could take a ship in half the time the shannon could the fall of the mainmast occurred when the fight was practically over it had no influence whatever on the conflict it was also asserted that her powder was bad but on no authority her first broadside fell short but so under similar circumstances did the first broadside of the united states none of these causes account for the fact that her shot did not hit her opponent was of such superior force nearly in the proportion of three to two that success would have been very difficult 
in any event, and no one can doubt the gallantry and pluck with which the British ship was fought, but the execution was very greatly disproportioned to the force. The gunnery of the Guerriere was very poor, and that of the Constitution excellent. During the few minutes the ships were yard-arm and yard-arm, the latter was not hulled once while no less than thirty shot took effect on the former's engaged side footnote captain dacre's address to the court-martial and a footnote five sheets of copper beneath the bends the guerriere moreover was out manoeuvred in wearing several times and exchanging broadsides in such rapid and continual changes of position her fire was much more harmless than it would have been if she had kept more steady footnote lord howard douglas treatise on naval gunnery london eighteen fifty one page four fifty four end of footnote the constitution was handled faultlessly captain hull displayed the coolness and the skill of a veteran in the way in which he managed first to avoid being raked and then to improve the advantage which the precision and rapidity of his fire had gained after making every allowance claimed by the enemy the character of this victory is not essentially altered its peculiarities were a fine display of seamanship in the approach extraordinary efficiency in the attack and great readiness in repairing damages all of which denote cool and capable officers with an expert and trained crew in a word a disciplined man of war footnote cooper volume two page one seventy three and a footnote the disparity of force ten to seven is not enough to account for the disparity of execution ten to two of course something must be allowed for the decayed state of the englishman's masts although i really do not think it had any influence on the battle for he was beaten when the main mast fell and it must be remembered on the other hand that the american crew was absolutely new while the guerriere was manned by old hands so that while admitting and admiring the gallantry and on the whole the seamanship of captain dacre and his crew and acknowledging that he fought at a great disadvantage especially in being short-handed yet all must acknowledge that the combat showed a marked superiority particularly in gunnery on the part of the americans had the ships not come foul captain hull would probably not have lost more than three or four men as it was he suffered but slightly that the guerriere was not so weak as she was represented to be can be gathered from the fact that she mounted two more main deck guns than the rest of her class thus carrying on her main deck thirty long eighteen pounders in battery to oppose to the thirty long twenty fours or rather allowing for the short weight of shot long twenty twos of the constitution characteristically enough james though he carefully reckons in the low bow chases in the bridle ports of the argus and enterprise yet refuses to count the two long eighteens mounted through the bridle ports on the guerriere's main deck now as it turned out these two bow guns were used very effectively when the ships got foul and caused more damage and loss than all of the other main deck guns put together captain dacre very much to his credit allowed the ten americans on board to go below so as not to fight against their flag and in his address to the court-martial mentions among the reasons for his defeat that he was very much weakened by permitting the americans on board to quit their quarters coupling this with the assertion made by james and most other british writers that the constitution was largely manned by englishmen we reach the somewhat remarkable conclusion that the british ship was defeated because the americans on board would not fight against their country 
and that the American was victorious because the British on board would. However, as I have shown in reality, there were probably not a score of British on board the Constitution. In this, as well as the two succeeding frigate actions, everyone must admit that there was a great superiority in force on the side of the victors, and British historians have insisted that this superiority was so great as to preclude any hopes of a successful resistance, that this was not true, and that the disparity between the combatants was not as great as had been the case in a number of encounters in which English frigates had taken French ones, can be best shown by a few accounts taken from the French historian Trude, who would certainly not exaggerate the difference. Thus on March 1st, 1799, the English 38-gun 18-pound frigate Sibylle captured the French 44-gun 24-pounder frigate Forte after an action of two hours and ten minutes. Footnote. Batille Navale de la France. O. Trude, Paris, 1868, volume 4, page 171, end of footnote. In actual weight, the shot thrown by one of the main deck guns of the defeated Forte was over six pounds heavier than the shot thrown by one of the main deck guns of the victorious Constitution or United States. Footnote. See Appendix B for actual weight of French shot. End of footnote. There are later examples than this, but a very few years before the declaration of war by the United States, and in the same struggle that was then still raging, there had been at least two victories gained by English frigates over French foes as superior to themselves as the American 44s were to the British ships they captured. On August 10th, 1805, the Phoenix 36 captured the Didon 40 after three and a half hours fighting, the comparative broadside force being Phoenix. Thirteen eighteen pounders, two nine pounders, six thirty two pounders, twenty one total guns, total pounds four hundred and forty four. Didon, fourteen eighteen pounders, two eight pounders, seven thirty six pounders, twenty three guns total, five hundred and twenty two pounds total. On March eighth, eighteen o eight, the San Lorenzo thirty six captured the Piedmontese. 40, the force being exactly what it was in the case of the Phoenix and Didon. Footnote, Ibid, page 499. Comparing the real, not the nominal weight of metal, we find that the Didon and the Piedmontese were proportionally of greater force compared to the Phoenix and San Florenzo than the Constitution was compared to the Guerriere or Java. The French 18s through each a shot weighing but about two pounds less than that thrown by an American 24 of 1812, while their 36-pound carronades each threw a shot over ten pounds heavier than that thrown by one of the Constitution's spar-deck 32s. That a 24-pounder cannot always whip an 18-pounder frigate is shown by the action of the British frigate Eurotus with the French frigate Chlorinde on February 25, 1814. Footnote James, volume 6, page 391, end of footnote. The first with a crew of 329 men threw 625 pounds of shot at a broadside, the latter carrying 344 men and throwing 463 pounds. Yet the result was indecisive. The French lost 90 and the British 60 men. The action showed that heavy metal was not of much use unless used well. To appreciate rightly the exultation Hull's victory caused in the United States and the intense annoyance it created in England, it must be remembered that during the past twenty years the island power had been at war with almost every state in europe 
at one time or another and in the course of about two hundred single conflicts between ships of approximately equal force that is where the difference was less than one half waged against french spanish italian turkish algerine russian danish and dutch antagonists her ships had been beaten and captured in but five instances then war broke out with america and in eight months five single ship actions occurred in every one of which the british vessel was captured even had the victories been due solely to superior force this would have been no mean triumph for the united states on october thirteenth eighteen twelve the american eighteen-gun ship sloop wasp captain jacob jones with one hundred thirty seven men aboard sailed from the delaware and ran off southeast to get into the track of the west india vessels on the sixteenth a heavy gale began to blow causing the loss of the jib boom and two men who were on it the next day the weather moderated somewhat and at eleven thirty p m in latitude thirty seven degrees north longitude sixty five degrees west several sail were descried footnote captain jones official letter november twenty fourth eighteen twelve and a footnote these were part of a convoy of fourteen merchantmen which had quitted the bay of honduras on september twelfth bound for england footnote james's history volume six page one fifty eight and a footnote under the convoy of the british eighteen gun brig sloop frolic of nineteen guns and one hundred ten men captain thomas win yates they had been dispersed by the gale of the sixteenth during which the frolic's main yard was carried away and both her topsails torn to pieces footnote captain winniates official letter october eighteenth eighteen twelve and a footnote next day she spent in repairing damages and by dark six of the missing ships had joined her the day broke almost cloudless on the eighteenth sunday showing the convoy ahead and to leeward of the american ship still some distance off as captain jones had not thought it prudent to close during the night while he was ignorant of the force of his antagonists the wasp now sent down to her topgallant yards close reefed her topsails and bore down under short fighting canvas while the frolic removed her main yard from the casks lashed it on deck and then hauled to the wind under her boom mainsail and close reefed fore topsail hoisting spanish colors to decoy the stranger under her guns and permit the convoy to escape at eleven thirty two the action began the two ships running parallel on the starboard tack not sixty yards apart the wasp firing her port and the frolic her starboard guns the latter fired very rapidly delivering three broadsides to the wasps two footnote cooper page one eighty two end of footnote both crews cheering loudly as the ships wallowed through the water there was a very heavy sea running which caused the vessels to pitch and roll heavily the americans fired as the engaged side of her ship was going down aiming at their opponent's hull footnote miles register page three twenty four end of footnote while the british delivered their broadsides while on the crests of the seas the shot going high the water dashed in clouds of spray over both crews and the vessels rolled so that the muzzles of the guns went under but in spite of the rough weather the firing was not only spirited but well directed at eleven thirty six the wasp's main top mast was shot away and fell with its yard across the port fore and foretop sail braces rendering the head yards unmanageable at eleven forty six the gaff and mizzen top gallant mast came down and by eleven fifty two every brace and most of the rigging was shot away 
Footnote, Captain Jones's letter. End of footnote. It would now have been very difficult to brace any of the yards. But meanwhile the frolic suffered it dreadfully in her hull and lower masts, and had her gaff and head braces shot away. Footnote. Captain Winniate's letter. End of footnote. The slaughter among her crew was very great, but the survivors kept at their work with the dogged courage of their race. At first the two vessels ran side by side, but the American gradually forged ahead, throwing in her fire from a position in which she herself received little injury. By degrees the vessels got so close that the Americans struck the frolic's side with their rammers in loading. Footnote, Captain Jones's letter, end of footnote. And the British brig was raked with dreadful effect. The frolic then fell aboard her antagonist, her jib boom coming in between the main and mizzen rigging of the wasp and passing over the heads of Captain Jones and Lieutenant Biddle, who were standing near the capstan. This forced the wasp up in the wind, and she again raked her antagonist, Captain Jones trying to restrain his men from boarding till he could put in another broadside. But they could no longer be held back, and Jack Lang, a New Jersey seaman, leaped on the frolic's bowsprit. Lieutenant Biddle then mounted on the hammock cloth to board, but his feet got entangled in the rigging, and one of the midshipmen seizing his coat-tails to help himself up, the lieutenant stumbled back on the deck. At the next swell he succeeded in getting on the bowsprit, on which there were already two seamen whom he passed on the forecastle. But there was no one to oppose him. Not twenty Englishmen were left unhurt. Footnote. Captain Winniate's letter. End of footnote. The man at the wheel was still at his post, grim and undaunted, and two or three more were on deck, including Captain Winniates and Lieutenant Wintle, both so severely wounded that they could not stand without support. Footnote, James, volume 6, page 161. There could be no more resistance, and Lieutenant Biddle lowered the flag at 12.15 just forty-three minutes after the beginning of the fight. Footnote. Captain Jones's letter. End of footnote. A minute or two afterward, both of the frolic's masts went by the board, the foremast about fifteen feet above the deck, the other short off. Of her crew, as already said, not twenty men had escaped unhurt. Every officer was wounded, two of them, the first lieutenant, Charles Mackay and Master John Stevens soon died. Her total loss was thus over ninety. Footnote. Captain Winniate's official letter thus states it, and is, of course, to be taken as authority. The Bermuda account makes it sixty-nine, and James only sixty-two. End of footnote. About thirty of whom were killed outright or died later. The wasp suffered very severely in her rigging and aloft generally, but only two or three shots struck her hull. Five of her men were killed, two in her mizzen top and one in her main top mast rigging, and five wounded. Footnote, Captain Jones's letter. End of footnote. Chiefly while aloft. The two vessels were practically of equal force. The loss of the frolic's main-yard had merely converted her into a brigantine, and as the roughness of the sea made it necessary to fight under very short canvas, her inferiority in men was fully compensated for by her superiority in metal. She had been desperately defended. No men could have fought more bravely than Captain Winniates and his crew. On the other hand, the Americans had done their work with a coolness and skill that could not be surpassed. The contest had been mainly one of gunnery, and had been decided by the greatly superior judgment and accuracy with which they fired. Both officers and crew had behaved well. 
captain jones particularly mentions lieutenant claxton who though too ill to be of any service persisted in remaining on deck throughout the engagement the wasp was armed with two long twelves and sixteen thirty-two pound carronades the frolic with two long sixes sixteen thirty-two pound carronades and one shifting twelve pound carronade comparative force the wasp four hundred and fifty tons nine guns two hundred and fifty pounds total weight one hundred and thirty five crew ten loss the frolic four hundred and sixty seven tons ten guns two hundred and seventy four total metal weight crew one hundred and ten loss ninety vice admiral urien de la gravier comments on this action as follows footnote guerres maritime volume two page two eighty seven septem edition paris eighteen eighty one end of footnote the american fire showed itself to be as accurate as it was rapid on occasions when the roughness of the sea would seem to render all aim excessively uncertain the effects of their artillery were not less murderous than under more advantageous conditions the corvette wasp fought the brig frolic in an enormous sea under very short canvas and yet forty minutes after the beginning of the action when the two vessels came together the americans who leaped aboard the brig found on the deck covered with dead and dying but one brave man who had not left the wheel and three officers all wounded who threw down their swords at the feet of the victors admiral de la gravier's criticisms are especially valuable because they are those of an expert who only refers to the war of eighteen twelve in order to apply to the french navy the lessons which it teaches and who is perfectly unprejudiced he cares for the lesson taught not the teacher and is quite as willing to learn from the defeat of the chesapeake as from the victories of the constitution while most american critics only pay heed to the latter the characteristics of the action are the practical equality of the contestants in point of force and the enormous disparity in the damage each suffered numerically the wasp was superior by five per cent and inflicted a ninefold greater loss captain jones was not destined to bring his prize into port for a few hours afterwards the poictier a british seventy four captain john power beresford hove in sight now appeared the value of the frolic's desperate defence if she could not prevent herself from being captured she had at least ensured her own recapture and also the capture of the foe when the wasp shook out her sails they were found to be cut into ribbons aloft and she could not make off with sufficient speed as the poctier passed the frolic rolling like a log in the water she threw a shot over her and soon overtook the wasp both vessels were carried into bermuda captain winniates was again put in command of the frolic captain jones and his men were soon exchanged twenty five thousand dollars prize money was voted to them by congress and captain and lieutenant biddle were both promoted the former receiving the captured ship macedonian unluckily the blockade was too close for him to succeed in getting out during the remainder of the war on october eighth commodore rogers left boston on his second cruise with the president united states congress and argus footnote letter of commodore rogers january first eighteen thirteen end of footnote leaving the hornet in port four days out the united states and argus separated while the remaining two frigates continued their cruise together the argus footnote letter of captain arthur sinclair january fourth eighteen thirteen end of footnote captain sinclair 
cruised to the eastward making prizes of six valuable merchantmen and returned to port on january third during the cruise she was chased for three days and three nights the latter being moonlight by a british squadron and was obliged to cut away her boats and anchors and start some of her water but she saved her guns and was so cleverly handled during the chase she actually succeeded in taking and manning a prize though the enemy got near enough to open fire as the vessels separated before relating what befell the united states we shall bring commodore rogers cruise to an end on october tenth the commodore chased but failed to overtake the british frigate nymph thirty eight captain epworth on the eighteenth off the great bank of newfoundland he captured the jamaica packet swallow homeward bound with two hundred thousand dollars in specie aboard on the thirty first at nine a m latitude thirty three degrees north longitude thirty two degrees west his two frigates fell in with the british frigate galatea thirty six captain woodley losack convoying two south sea ships to windward the galatea ran down to reconnoitre and at ten a m recognizing her foes hauled up on the starboard tack to escape the american frigates made all sail in chase and continued beating to windward tacking several times for about three hours seeing that she was being overhauled the galatea now edged away to get on her best point of sailing at the same moment one of her convoy the argo bore up to cross the hawse of her foes but was intercepted by the congress who lay to to secure her meanwhile the president kept after the galatea she set her topmast topgallant mast and lower studding sails and when it was dusk had gained greatly upon her but the night was very dark the president lost sight of the chase and toward midnight hauled to the wind to rejoin her consort the two frigates cruised to the east as far as twenty two degrees west and then ran down to seventeen degrees north but during the month of november they did not see a sail they had but slightly better luck on their return toward home passing one hundred twenty miles north of bermuda and cruising a little while toward the virginia capes they re-entered boston on december thirty first having made nine prizes most of them of little value when four days out on october twelfth commodore decatur had separated from the rest of rogers squadron and cruised east on the twenty fifth in latitude twenty nine degrees north and longitude twenty nine degrees thirty minutes west while going close hauled on the port tack with the wind fresh from the south southeast a sail was descried on the weather beam about twelve miles distant footnote official letter of commodore decatur october thirtieth eighteen twelve end of footnote this was the british thirty eight gun frigate macedonian captain john surnam carden she was not like the guerriere an old ship captured from the french but newly built of oak and larger than any american eighteen-pounder frigate she was reputed very wrongfully to be a crack ship according to lieutenant david hope the state of discipline on board was excellent in no british ship was more attention paid to gunnery before this cruise the ship had been engaged almost every day with the enemy and in time of peace the crew was constantly exercised at the great guns footnote marshall's naval biography volume four page one thousand eighteen end of footnote how they could have practised so much and learned so little is certainly marvellous the macedonian set her foretop mast and tap gallant studding sails and bore away in chase footnote captain carden to mr croker 
October 28, 1812, end of footnote, edging down with the wind a little aft the starboard beam. Her first lieutenant wished to continue on this course and pass down ahead of the United States. Footnote, James, volume 6, page 165. But Captain Cardin's over-anxiety to keep the weather gauge lost him this opportunity of closing. Footnote. Sentence of court-martial held on the San Domingo 74 at the Bermudas, May 27, 1812. End of footnote. Accordingly, he hauled by the wind and passed way to windward of the American. As Commodore Decatur got within range, he eased off and fired a broadside, most of which fell short. Footnote Marshall, volume 4, page 1080. End of footnote. He then kept his luff, and the next time he fired, his long twenty-fours told heavily, while he received very little injury himself. Footnote Cooper, 11, page 178, and a footnote. The friar from his main deck, for he did not use his carronades at all for the first half hour, footnote, letter of Commodore Decatur, and a footnote, was so very rapid that it seemed as if the ship was on fire. His broadsides were delivered with almost twice the rapidity of those of the Englishmen. Footnote James, volume 6, page 169, end of footnote. The latter soon found he could not play at long bowls with any chance of success, and, having already erred either from timidity or bad judgment, Captain Carden decided to add rashness to the catalogue of his virtues. Accordingly, he bore up and came down end on toward his adversary, with the wind on his port quarter. The States now, 10.15, laid her main topsail aback and made heavy play with her long guns, and, as her adversary came nearer, with her cannonades also. The British ship would reply with her starboard guns, hauling up to do so. As she came down, the American would ease off, run a little way, and again come to, keeping up a terrific fire. As the Macedonian bore down to close, the chocks of all her forecastle guns, which were mounted on the outside, were cut away. Footnote. Letter of Captain Cardin. End of footnote. Her fire caused some damage to the American's rigging, but hardly touched her hull, while she herself suffered so heavily both alow and aloft that she gradually dropped to leeward while the American forereached on her. Finding herself ahead and to windward, the States tacked and ranged up under her adversary's lee when the latter struck her colors at 11.15, just an hour and a half after the beginning of the action. Footnote, letter of Commodore Decatur. End of footnote. The United States had suffered surprisingly little. What damage had been done was aloft. Her mizzen top gallant mast was cut away, some of the spars were wounded, and the rigging a good deal cut. The hull was only struck two or three times. The ships were never close enough to be within fair range of grape and musketry. Footnote. Letter of Commodore Decatur. End of footnote and the wounds were mostly inflicted by round shot and were thus apt to be fatal hence the loss of the americans amounted to lieutenant john messer funk fifth of the ship and six seamen killed or mortally wounded and only five severely and slightly wounded the macedonian on the other hand had received over a hundred shot in her hull several between wind and water her mizzenmast had gone by the board her fore and maintop masts had been shut away by the caps and her main yard in the slings 
almost all her rigging was cut away, only the foresail being left. On the engaged side, all of her carronades but two, and two of her main deck guns, were dismounted. Of her crew, forty-three were killed and mortally wounded, and sixty-one, including her first and third lieutenants, severely and slightly wounded. Footnote, letter of Captain Carden. End of footnote. Among her crew were eight Americans, as shown by her muster roll. These asked permission to go below before the battle, but it was refused by Captain Carden, and three were killed during the action. James says that they were allowed to go below, but this is untrue, for if they had, the three would not have been slain. The others testified that they had been forced to fight, and they afterward entered the American service. The only ones of the Macedonian crew who did or who were asked to. The Macedonian had her full complement of 301 men. The States had, by her muster roll of October 20th, 428 officers, petty officers, seamen, and boys, and 50 officers and privates of marines, a total of 478, instead of 509 as Marshall in his naval biography makes it comparative force the united states one thousand five hundred seventy six tons twenty seven guns seven hundred eighty six pounds of metal four hundred seventy eight men twelve lost macedonian thirteen hundred twenty five tons twenty five guns five hundred forty seven pounds of metal three hundred one men one hundred and four lost comparative loss inflicted states one hundred one hundred macedonian sixty six eleven that is the relative force being about as three is to two footnote i have considered the united states as mounting her full allowance of fifty four guns but it is possible that she had no more than forty nine in Decatur's letter of challenge of January 17, 1814, which challenge, by the way, was a most blustering affair, reflecting credit neither on Decatur nor his opponent, Captain Hope, nor on anyone else, excepting Captain Stockpole of HMS Statira. She is said to have had that number. Her broadside would then be fifteen long twenty-fours below, one long twenty-four, one twelve-pounder, and eight forty-two-pound carronades above. A real broadside weight of metal would thus be about six hundred eighty pounds, and she would be superior to the Macedonian in the proportion of five to four. But it is possible that Decatur had landed some of his guns in 1813, as james asserts and though i am not at all sure of this i have thought it best to be on the safe side in describing his force and a footnote the damage done was as nine to one of course it would have been almost impossible for the macedonian to conquer with one-third less force but the disparity was by no means sufficient to account for the ninefold greater loss suffered, and the ease and impunity with which the victory was won. The British sailors fought with their accustomed courage, but their gunnery was exceedingly poor. And it must be remembered that, though the ship was bravely fought, still the defence was by no means so desperate as that made by the Essex or even the Chesapeake, as witnessed by their respective losses the macedonian moreover was surrendered when she had suffered less damage than either the guerriere or the java the chief cause of her loss lay in the fact that captain carden was a poor commander the gunnery of the java guerriere and macedonian was equally bad but while captain lambert proved himself to be as able as he was gallant and captain dacre did nearly as well 
Captain Carden, on the other hand, was first too timid and then too rash, and showed a bad judgment at all times. By continuing his original course he could have closed at once, but he lost his chance by over-anxiety to keep the weather gauge, and was censured by the court-martial accordingly. Then he tried to remedy one error by another, and made a foolishly rash approach. A very able and fair-minded English writer says of this action, As a display of courage the character of the service was nobly upheld, but we would be deceiving ourselves were we to admit that the comparative expertness of the crews in gunnery was equally satisfactory. Now, taking the difference of effect as given by Captain Carden, we must draw this conclusion, that the comparative loss in killed and wounded, 104 to 12, together with the dreadful account he gives of the condition of his own ship, while he admits that the enemy's vessel was in comparatively good order, must have arisen from inferiority in gunnery as well as in force. Footnote. Lord Howard Douglas, Naval Gunnery, page 525. End of part 5